So you have an exam on Friday. Um, so let's talk about that. Um, so we're going to do the thing where we split up the classroom again. So I've got to make a note to myself to figure out how that's going to work. Um, that worked out pretty well last time, the splitting the rooms thing. That was OK. Oh, we get, oh it's open. Good. OK, so um, all right, I'll make a note to myself to split up the rooms. Um, let me just actually make that note for real so I don't forget. Uh, so, um, so is there any interest in a review? Yes. Yeah. Okay. How about we do that on Wednesday? All right. Um, hold on. Split room exam. Okay. So here's how Wednesday's lecture will work. Come with questions. Okay. Uh, examples of questions are like, uh, here's a problem. Will you help me solve it? Uh, examples of not questions are, I don't understand anything, and I haven't bothered <laughs> to read anything or do any work on my own. Could you just explain it to me, because that's easier than studying. Um, that, not so much. So come with, like, real questions, and, you know, we'll burn a lecture doing that. Like, I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, but like I said, it, these things tend to work better when you come prepared. Um, so there's my two cents. Okay? Um, so there's... Um, I think I still have uh, online the, uh, the old exam that I once gave the last time I taught this course. So you should look at that because I think it has some stuff that's relevant. Uh, but again, homework, recitation, uh, not, you know, recitation, homework, lab, um, those are all fair game. So just, you know, that's a good source of, uh, a good source of questions and stuff. All right? Yeah, on the old exam, there's only really like two. Two that are applicable. Yeah, so maybe not so much. I'll post a solution to it anyway. Yeah, it's, it's better than nothing. Like I said, it's I, a little bit that's like your hard time for not, you know, for, I haven't taught this course before, so except that one time, so it's, um, I don't, it's not like I have a treasure trove of uh, old exams to, to push you away, otherwise I would. I'm just looking at it, that exam <laughs> right now. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's got some stuff on there. Got some phaser stuff. That's pretty good. Yeah. Oh, yeah it's, that's not a, I'll post solutions for that. Um, how long was this test? Holy mackerel. <laughs> Page 10 of 10. <laughs> What's wrong with me? Okay. Um, okay, so we're going to finish our conversation about um, uh, the power conversation we're having. And then hopefully today we're going to get to maximum power. So uh, we're, we're talking about AC power, and today we're going to talk about maximum power. Is, is anything from chapter 9 going to be on the test? Nope. Chapter 9 is not on the test. So uh, I did post on Blackboard a list of topics, you know, and I will, I'll stick to that. That's sort of my, my pledge to you. So we did it on a, in class on, uh, what was it, Friday? Did we have class, or was that one of those days where we all were hurricane out? Um, so we had a cap, and we had a resistor, and we had a voltage source, right? And um, we were trying to calculate the average power in each element. Is that right? And we're going to prove that they all added up. And we did one of those elements. Was it the um, capacitor? And what did we decide? What was the deal with the capacitor? Zero, right? So I think we decided that the, um, that the, at the power, the average power of the cap equaled zero. And we talked about that a little bit, right? We talked about why that sort of makes sense, right? The capacitor is sometimes charging, sometimes discharging, but if you're powering the system with an alternating current, it's not unreasonable to expect that, you know, for every half a cycle when the cap is charging, there's a half a cycle when it discharges. So on average, it's not doing anything. So to the extent that this circuit is going to burn energy on average, it's got to have to be in the resistor. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate that. Um, so I, I don't really remember. Do we, can somebody refresh my memory on what our cap and resistor and voltage source were? Was the resistor one ohm? And the capacitor was one? And what was my voltage source? Cosine T. Cosine T. So that means that the frequency was one. Good. So my... Um, so my capacitor impedance is, we said, 1 over j omega c, which is minus j. 
which is equal to one angle minus 90 degrees. We'll stick with degrees now, even though I said that that's amateur hour. That's uh, one ohm or one key? I'm sorry, one, just one. Ohm. Ohm, yes. Right, so that's, I should be more specific. One ohm, one farad. So that's how we set up the problem. And we had this formula. We said that the, uh, the average power is equal to the voltage times the current over 2 times the cosine of the difference between their phases. Is that roughly correct? We derived that formula. That, that is always the average power for an AC, sig for a, you know, for a AC signal. Does it matter whether, in this cosine, does it matter if it's theta V minus theta I or theta I minus theta V? Like, can I, can I swap those? Do I have to sweat that detail? Nope. Doesn't matter. Because remember, if you take cosine of theta or cosine of negative theta, it's the same thing. Because cosine is an even function. So if I forget and I write theta I minus theta V, it doesn't matter. It's going to work out to the same answer. Okay, so we did the cap. Let's do the resistor. I need I need a expression for the voltage across the resistor, and I need an, an equation for the current through the resistor. And once I have those in phasor notation, I'll be able to plug in everything I need here. So what do you want to start with for the resistor? The voltage or the uh, or the current? Voltage. All right. So can somebody tell me a uh, quick and easy um, equation to give me the voltage across the resistor? V equals IZ. Yes. So you can actually do, yeah, you can actually do voltage divider here to get the voltage across the resistor. Did you know that? Voltage divider doesn't just apply to this guy. Voltage divider can apply to any guy in the system. And here's how it works. We would say that the, uh, the voltage across the resistor is going to equal... The source, in phasor notation, what's my source? What's my source in phasor notation? In phasor notation, one angle zero, right? Because it's got a magnitude of one and a phase of zero. So it's my source, one angle zero, times my resistor, R, over R plus one over J omega C. It's just a voltage divider, right? Except instead of putting the capacitor in the numerator, we put the resistor in the numerator. Okay, so let's let's sub in the numbers that we know. This is actually going to be pretty sweet. It's one angle zero. The resistor is one. I like that. And my denominator is going to be one minus J. Is that right? Because it's resistor, R, is 1. And 1 over J omega C is minus J. So that's cool. Um, all right, how do I do that division? Exam on Friday, what was that? I'm sorry. Switch to polar form. How can I express that denominator in polar form? There's 1. Here's minus J. So I'm trying to get this guy. So it looks like its magnitude is root 2 angle minus 45 degrees. OK, and if you forgot somehow to eyeball it, you can get that phase angle by taking the inverse tangent of negative 1 over 1. And that would give you negative 45 degrees or whatever that comes out to in radians. All right, am I ready to divide? I am 1 over root 2, angle 45 degrees. Sweet. OK, so what have I just learned? Remember, I'm trying to sub into this expression. What have I just solved for? Vm and theta v. Right? This number is the magnitude 
of my resistor voltage, and this is the phase angle of my resistor voltage. So that's good. I've got two of my four terms. What's next? Got to do the current. Hey, guess what? We've already done the current. You remember when we did the capacitor? Would you agree with me that the current going through the capacitor is the same as the current going through the resistor? Do we need to resolve for the current going through the resistor? No, we don't. We can use the same values we got before. So if someone could turn back and help me out. I think we said that IM was equal to, was it also 1 over root 2? Okay, and then theta I was positive 45. Okay, I'm liking where this is going. Okay, so putting it all together, we have 1 over root 2 times 1 over root 2 over 2 times cosine of 45 minus 45. Okay, let's start with that cosine. Cosine of 0 is 1. I like that. So I'm left with 1 over root 2 times 1 over root 2 is a half. Divided by 2 is a quarter. And we're done. Because the cosine became 1. A quarter what? Watts? There we go. What do you need? Yes, sir. V sub M. Voltage magnitude. And then theta sub V. Right here? That says resistor. Okay, so what are your thoughts? Does this make sense? Eh, it seems reasonable, right? I mean, it's not awful. Um, okay. All right, so lastly, we're going to look at our, um, our voltage source. Okay, we want to calculate the power going to the voltage source so we can verify that we get the same power. You know, the, all the power that's being dissipated in the circuit has to come from somewhere, and that has to add up. And I think it's a valuable exercise to go through and calculate these powers just to show that this ain't magic, that this actually works. And I should point out that I've not done this example at home, so I'm just hoping that my intuition is right and these are all going to add up. Uh, if not, we're just going to have a mess on the board. Uh, should we try? Okay, so I want to calculate now the average power in the source. Okay, and as always, it's going to be the same equation, right? We don't have to, that equation doesn't require any love. Cosine of what? Theta V minus theta I. So, again, it's, it's voltage and current with respect to the device that we're actually interested in, which is the source in this case. So, um, so what is VM and theta V for the source? One and theta v zero. What is I m for the source? Same current as before, right? The current hasn't changed. There's only one current in this in this problem. So one over root two. Angle forty five degrees. I'm hoping this works. Otherwise, I'm going to look like a knucklehead. All right. So let's give this a shot. Putting all this together. We have 1 times 1 over root 2 divided by 2 times cosine of theta v, which is 0, minus theta i, 45 degrees. Okay, help a guy out. What's cosine of negative 45 degrees? Root 2 over 2. Cosine of negative 45 degrees is root 2 over 2. So now I've got 1 times 1 over root 2 over 2 times my cosine, which is root 2 over 2, 
You're not going to believe this. The root twos cancel. The twos multiply. And I get a quarter. So that matches. I like that. Right? That's, that makes me feel good. I mean, we can at least do this basic manipulation and it works out. So there you go. So there's like one end-to-end -end example uh, with a simple circuit. We can calculate, uh, again, power is something we've looked at before uh, in circuits one and a little bit in the beginning of the semester. What we're adding here, what's different now, is that instead of using calculating power, we have DC sources. Right? And remember, DC source is one that's direct current, doesn't change. Now we have alternating current. Your, 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 source, is, um, your source is sinusoidal. All right, and that changes the math a little bit. Maybe you have to use phasor notation to manage it, but luckily it works out pretty well. And all the same concepts apply. Right? At the end of the day, the average powers have to add up. The instantaneous powers have to add up too. So we said the cap had zero average power. Does the cap have zero instantaneous power? No, absolutely not. Sometimes the cap has positive power which means it's, it's, um, it's taking energy in. And sometimes it has negative power, which means it's pushing electrons back out into the circuit. But on the average, if you average the power over one period, you'll find that it's, it averages to zero. Over one period, it puts out as much power as it puts in. Resistor doesn't have that luxury, right? Whether current is going this way or current is going this way, the resistor is still generating heat, right? The resistor doesn't care what direction the current's going. It's not like it's charging and discharging. That's it. Electrons go through it, you get heat. Okay, so it's always dissipating power. That's why you have an average power. So it's non-zero on the resistor. We good? Okay. Well, let's dig in a little further. So let's talk about maximum power now. So there's all sorts of applications where you're going to want to be able to maximize the amount of power you deliver to your load. The book has a really long derivation on this. I'm going to do a little bit more of a hand wavy approach. It'll save us like three pages of burn, you know, just calculus for no reason. Um, but I think it gets us to roughly the same explanation. Um, before I start, I just want to remind you of something so that we, we have this in our memory because we're going to need this detail and you might have forgotten it. Um, we did this example a little while ago. Um, so this is the source resistor. This is the load resistor. That's your supply. Remember we went through this example and we said, how can we choose the load resistor to maximize the power delivered to the load? We answered that question, right? We said, pick load resistor such that, ST means such that, such that um, power to the load is maximized. Do you remember what we came up with? Yeah, exactly. RL had to be the same as the source resistor, right? And what we did to calculate that is first we calculated an expression for the average power through the load. Then we took its derivative with respect to the resistor. And we found that that power maximizes when the, when the source and the load resistor are the same. It just happened to work out. And the intuition was that if you make your load resistor, remember power is voltage times current. If you make your load resistor bigger, it gets a bigger voltage according to the voltage divider equation, but it gets less current because there's more impedance to stop current flowing. So you make voltage bigger and current smaller. Conversely, if you make it smaller, you make the current bigger, but the voltage smaller. So if, again, if you're trying to get their product to be maximized, it turned out that the way to do that was to set these two resistors equal to each other, and that maximizes that trade-off between voltage and current. And that's how we came up with that. All right? So now we're going to play the same. We, we need to keep this information in the back of our heads. So now we're going to play the same game, but we're going to play the same game a little bit differently. 
we're going to put, instead of a resistor up here, we're going to put a source, a source impedance. So it could be complex. And we're going to have a load impedance. And it's going to be complex. And I want to know, how can I pick a load impedance such that power to the load is maximized? OK? And I should say, in doing this example, I care less about the answer and more about the approach. Because you can always look the answer up in a book, and we'll talk about what the answer means and why that's relevant and so on. But what I really care about is like you have these kind of engineering problem-solving skills. Like I like when folks can just sort of figure this stuff out. So um, how could I figure this out? Like, let's say I don't have the book in front of me. How can I go about coming up with some sort of answer on how to, on how to deal with this? Sorry, hold on, let me just hold on a second. How do you mean make them equivalent? Uh, not sure. Just that's the way it worked before. That's the way it worked before, and we're going to use that trick. Sorry, yes. P source equals the total power. PL is going to equal the power in the source. But then there will be no power coming out of the source. Or the C, yeah, okay. It may be, well, think about it. Yeah, I, I think the best thing we can do is to write an expression for the power in the load and then try to maximize that equation. Sound reasonable? Okay. Now, um, in theory, we've already done this, right? We've already done that equation to calculate what the max, what the uh, what the average power is. Uh, that was the the the, the PV, sorry, the, the VM IM over two times cosine. We've already looked at that. Um, I'm going to approach it a little bit differently, not because the first way doesn't work; it works just fine. I think this way is maybe just a little bit less cumbersome mathematically. So here's, I'd like to just start by calculating the power to the load. The power to the load, by definition, is going to be the voltage to the load times the current to the load. All right, so, uh, so, the, power, so the voltage to the load is going to be uh, the source times ZL over ZL plus Z source. Is that correct? That's the voltage. That's the voltage that makes it to the to the load. It's just a voltage divider, and then I have to multiply that by the current that's seen at the load, and the current that's seen at the load is V S over Z load plus Z source, right? Just V over impedance. I think in the book instead of calling it Z source, they call it Z thevenin. Whatever. It's just a name. Okay. Now, our impedances are complex, are they not? Our impedances are complex. So why don't we say that my, uh, my load impedance, let me just write that as having a real part plus um, an imaginary part. Right? Impedance is a complex number, is it not? So let me write it as having a real part and an imaginary part. And likewise, my source impedance is going to have a real part and an imaginary part. You know what we're going to do now, right? <laughs> we're going to substitute. Ugh. OK, so let's do this substitution. It's actually not that bad. So I'm going to substitute these two expressions in. So we've got our voltage su supply squared times the load resistor, so the load impedance, which is RL plus J 
XL. So that's easy. Okay, now in the denominator, I've got the sum of these two expressions squared. Okay, so let's just start by summing those expressions. So if I sum those expressions, I've got RL plus RS, those are the real parts, plus J times XL plus XS, and it's all that squared, is it not? Have I lied yet? I think I'm done doing math for now. This is I think we're okay. Um, so let's just stop and look at this expression. Again, the hard way is to start taking some derivatives and maximizing. But I think we can sort of, you know, we can kind of uh, be a little bit creative and figure out ways of maximizing this. Now remember, when you maximize a fraction, you either maximize the numerator or minimize the denominator. Is that fair? So, um, let's look at that denominator. Is there a way I could maximize that denominator pretty easily? Is there one, one thing I could do that would work right off the bat? Could I zero? Is there, is there a way I could choose my load that I could zero out one of those terms? I could get rid of the J term altogether. Could I not? What if I selected that my, the imaginary part of my load was equal to the negative of the imaginary part of my source? Can I do that? Totally, right? That's completely legitimate, right? I can always, I can always, like, if, um, if I've got a capacitor in my source, I can put an inductor in my load, and they'll, they'll cancel each other out, and I can make this happen. Right? You can definitely have a positive or negative complex impedance. So why don't I start by choosing this? Because if I make that choice, this term will disappear completely, and it's hard to minimize it any more than making it zero. Right? I can't do any better than making it zero. So that's, that term is maximized. So, so I've already just, so all I'm trying to decide is how to choose my load in order to maximize power. My load has got two components, imaginary part and a real part. I've maximized my, I've selected my load to maximize this. So now I just have to, to so I've maximized the imaginary part. Now I have to deal with the real part. So again, sparing us the pages of calculus, just based on an intuition approach, based on what you've seen before, how do you think I can choose my load resistor to maximize this equation. Given what we saw before. <laughs> well, if you make your load as small as possible, your denominator gets small, but your numerator gets small. Right? Whereas if you make your resistor big, then your denominator gets big, which is good. That maximizes things. But then your denominator gets big as well, which also maximizes things. So that so which minimizes things. So that so they work against each other. Yes. You can't, but you can't have a negative resistor, right? right? That's where that's the that's the trick you get in. That's the the, the, the headache. Yeah, we did this before when it was purely resistive, right? When it was purely resistive, we came up with this solution. Okay. We've proved it mathematically. And all I'm doing today is saying this can be proven mathematically, that this maximizes this, but I really don't feel like filling four pages of chalkboard, and I don't think we'd really learn all that much in the process. So we've proven it once. I don't feel the need to double prove it. But essentially, it's the same trade-off, right? If you make your, your load resistor too big, that's good because your numerator gets big. That maximizes the numerator, but it comes at the cost of making your denominator big, which makes it smaller. So they work against each other. It's the same voltage divider concept. So it turns out that maximum trade-off is if you set them equal to each other. So long story short, long story short, you maximize, so, so given that your source impedance has got a real part and an imaginary part, 
then your maximum power, your max power to load, happens when your load is equal to RS minus the same real part, but the opposite imaginary part. Is there a name for that? Same real part, different imaginary part. Complex conjugate. Woo! Okay. So who cares? Um, no, I care. Let's do an example. So. So let's say, for example, I give you this circuit. playing with fire here. I haven't done this example at home. Historically, I do very well as long as I prep these things ahead of time. But, um, you know, sometimes it's kind of interesting to try these things out on the fly. Okay, so let's see. Let's have a source here. Uh, cosine 2 pi. Oh, let's live dangerously. Let's make it a 60 hertz cosine. And I said, well, one, you know what? I'm going to skip the one farad. Can I make that um, 10 microfarads? Whoa. Okay, so here I've got a source impedance. I've got, sorry, I've got a source. I've got a source impedance. Okay, and as a circuit designer, I'm asking you to to select Z load to maximize power to load. And not just select ZL, but actually put a resistor and a capacitor in here for me. Help a guy out. Right? Tell me what elements to put here. Not just don't just give me like some complex you know nonsense. Let's actually build the circuit elements. I should keep us busy for 20 minutes. Okay. So, what's my strategy? What's the strategy? How can I maximize power to load? So we've learned that in order to maximize the power to the load, how do I have to select my load? The complex conjugate of the source impedance. So do you think maybe the first thing we should do is calculate the source impedance? I mean, it can't hurt. Shall we try that? OK. So let's see. What's our source impedance? 10? Just 10? Minus J. Minus J. Over? Omega C. Yeah. Right? The source impedance is all this stuff. I got a resistor and a capacitor. And they are in series. So I can just add them. Yes, oh, there wasn't a hand. Okay. So I've got 10. 10 is the resistor, plus 1 over j omega c. Adding 1 over j omega c is the same as subtracting j over omega c. Okay. So what's, uh, what's my omega? Uh, omega equals 2 pi 60. All right, so it's calculator time. Where's my calculator? Let's have a couple people work this and see what we get. 2 pi times 60 times. 
capacitor, which is 10 E6 minus times, and reciprocate. Ooh! Wow, that worked out interestingly. I'm getting 10 minus J265. Can I get a confirmation on that? Get a couple votes. Okay. <clears throat> what load will maximize power? N plus J two sixty five. Can I build that? How can I actually build an impedance that has, how can I actually like, what do I put in here, like string and tape or like resistors or like a paper clip? Like what do I put here to make that? The inductor? Capacitor? I'm getting a vote for an inductor. What's an inductor going to buy me? Right. Remember, inductor has always got the impedance of... J omega L. Positive J omega L, which is good. I need a positive J omega L. Come on, dude. Okay. So, yeah, I think we can make a good, good argument that we can get this piece from from an inductor. What about the 10? Where am I going to get the 10 from? Resistor! <laughs> All right. Okay. How will those resistor and inductor be located? In parallel, in series, in a knot? Like what? In series. in series. Okay, look at you. So I'm going to have a resistor and an inductor. How big is my resistor going to be? 10 ohms. 10 ohms. Look at that. Good. I can't work like this. I don't know what I should stand underneath that. <laughs> I'm not sure my life insurance would cover me if uh, you know I died like so stupidly standing under a grate. Um, yes. Why is it plus? Because we learned that in order to maximize power to the load, you have to pick the complex conjugate. And by that definition, it's same real part opposite imaginary part. So that's what I did. I retained the real part, flipped the sign on the imaginary part. So I've got myself a resistor. How do I get the inductor now? Yep. J omega L has to equal J265. What's my omega? Same as before. So L is going to equal 265 over omega, which is 2 pi 60. What? 2 div pi div 60. Div 0 0.7? 0 0.7 Henry's. And there you go. So your resistor was 10 ohms. And this was uh, 7 tenths of a Henry, and you've maximized power to load. That's pretty interesting. So what's a couple thoughts off of this? What if I changed my, what if I changed the frequency of my power supply? Would I still be set up for maximum power? It's actually a fair question. I don't know, would I? Let's see if we can do this in terms of, um, we know the resistor's not going to change, right? The resistor's not changing for anybody, OK? So, um, so my question now is, if I change the frequency of my source, what would happen? So 
we want, uh, we said the impedance, of the, the impedance of the source is R plus, sorry, R minus uh, J over omega C. And then for the load, we had R plus J omega L. And we basically wanted the imaginary parts to be equal to each other, right? Equal and opposite. So we would have to, so the calculation we said was that 1 over omega C equaled omega L. And that's, I'm basically just recalculating. This is basically what we already did. So we calculated that L equaled 1 over omega squared C. Let me just double check. Is that right? So we had omega 2 pi 60 squared times the capacitor, which was 10 microfarads, 10 E6 sine. Yeah, so that works out. So if you plug in 2 pi 60 and 10 microfarads, this gives you back the, the 7 tenths of a Henry that we talked about. So if I change my frequency, what happens? Does my inductor change? Yeah, absolutely. So that's really interesting, right? This concept of maximum power, it actually depends on, it depends on the frequency that we pick. Yeah. Sorry? No, they multiply. Divide both sides by omega. Right? If you divide both sides by omega, you get omega squared down here, and then it disappears on this side. Yeah, so absolutely. So this is really interesting. This concept of maximum of maximizing the power to the output depends not only on the elements, but it also depends on the frequency that you're driving the system with. Let me show you one other interesting thing. Does this, this equation look at least partially familiar to anybody? Exam on Friday? Well, I'm sorry. If I rewrite that, can I not rewrite that as omega squared equals 1 over LC? Does that look familiar? Absolutely. Right? Essentially what you're doing is you're selecting the capacitor and the inductor so that they, I mean, a capacitor and an inductor, when you, when you, when you sort of connect them to each other, right, their natural inclination is to slosh power back and forth to each other. Right? First the capacitor has the power, then it passes it to the inductor, and then back and forth and back and forth. But they prefer to do it at some frequencies versus other frequencies, right? And it turns out that they're, if, if you select the, their optimal frequency for, the, for that pair to be the frequency that you're, op, that, that you're powering the circuit with, that's how you get the maximum power transfer. So it's nice. Like, this isn't even, like, totally a surprise. We should have expected that. We've already spent time studying how that's how you pick a resistor-capacitor pair to maximize their operation at a certain frequency. I can't wait for that. Five more minutes. Okay, so what do you think? Does that make sense? I think it makes sense. I think it works pretty nicely, actually. So having done this example, we could get as sophisticated as we want to be, right? I could, I could put a, a resistor in parallel, okay, and say, design me a, design me a load. Uh, I could say, um, I'll tell you another uh, possibility. So we have, um, sometimes your loads can be pretty, pretty complicated. So in this case, we've worked the example where we pick the load to match the, the source. But um, sometimes you do the other way. So let's say, for example, you're, um, you're trying to make a defibrillator. Right? So there's this pretty common model of, um, of the interface, like this, the, this, this skin body interface. Like if you put an electrode on the, on the body and you want to pass electricity into the body, you're sort of, you know, you have to get through the skin, the muscle and all that. And it's been pretty well shown that you can model it like this, a, a resistance and then in series with a resistor, which is in parallel with a capacitor. So um, this is sort of like the impedance of the skin. And then you have, um, you know, what, this is the electrode itself. So there's a capacitative element and a resistive element to the actual electrode. And obviously what you want to do is if you're, trying to, if you're trying to defibrillate this person, you want to maximize the power that makes it through, right? Otherwise, 
What's the point? So you can start to think about how to design a, uh, a source impedance that would, um, that would maximize that transfer. Okay, but now you have this, the, the tools to do that. You can just calculate what the impedance is here and then use that to, to justify your, your source impedance. So the, people do this all the time. Like This is, I think, a, a, a pretty common calculation that the people sweat. But at the end of the day, once you do the derivation, there's really nothing to it. right? You're just trying to find the complex conjugate impedance. Okay, so we're going to call it a day there, uh, especially in light of all the noise out there. What I would like, if you could, is... Um, just for, for homework, I hesitate to even call it homework, but uh, could you please work, where is it? Could you please work problem 9-5 from the book? Uh, exa sorry, example 9-5. Example 9-5, which is on page um, 444. It tells you how to do it. I mean, it comes with a solution, but just do it with a pencil. Don't just read it. Actually, like, work through the equations. See if you can do part of it without actually having to look at these solutions, but just kind of work it just for uh, experience. And then I'll see you on uh, Wednesday. Please come prepared with questions. Thank you.